Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm Thomas J.M. Peterson. I'm the founder and chairman of Coping Atomics. And we set up this company four years ago with a dream or a vision that we wanted to build a 40-foot shipping container that contained uh, a thorium breeder molten salt reactor. And we wanted to be able to configure this molten salt reactor in a way where it can also burn spent nuclear fuel, just like Roy talked about before. Um, and when we started to execute this plan, and we realized that lots of research were needed or lots of R&D were needed. Um, so we started out choosing three areas where we were, wanted to be particular uh, focused on. Those areas are uh, measurement technologies, it's salt chemistry, uh, cleaning up of the salts, and finally, control software and simulation software for molten salt reactors. And we're still working primarily on those three areas. In order to, uh, to do the actual engineering of this, we had to build up uh, a facility with uh, several loops where we can uh, test the salt chemistry and test pumps and valves and all the measurement technologies. So we've built a number of loops. Um, oh yeah, and this black uh, thing here, you can see we have one of the loops, we have a window so we can actually see the salt flowing. Um, people find that a lot of fun. Um, and we have uh, instruments also where we can handle the salts in atmosphere, uh, argon atmospheres, because as you know, salts are corrosive if they see oxygen. And the big deal here is to make sure that you have an, an environment that is completely oxygen free. A little bit about some of the products that we are developing for the molten salt industry. One is called LIPS. It's a laser induced breakdown spectroscopy. It's a technology where you can measure the, the, the different isotopes or all the different elements in the salt. And you really need that because when you're running a reactor, you want to know what's going on inside the reactor. You want to know if there's played out. You want to know if there's corrosion or if there is damage to any of your uh, mechanic or if there is damage to, to any of your uh, mechanical components and the, this uh, LIPS technology allow you to measure uh, all the different isotopes uh, in the salt at real time uh, without having to take samples out. Uh, the way it works for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, LIPS technology is you, you send a, a laser pulse in through the barriers so in molten salt reactor we have several barriers so you, you send it through windows and lenses, and then you get in, and you, uh, the laser pulse hits the surface of the salt, whether it's molten or frozen salt, it doesn't matter. Hits the surface, creates a spark. You collect the light from that spark, take it back, and do uh, the analysis on the light, get all the spectral lines of the different elements and isotopes. So this is one of the technologies that we're developing, and we hope it will help the, all these players in the molten salt industry uh, to move faster when they have to do the actual engineering. Uh, this is both useful for R&D and of course for running the real reactor and knowing what's going on in the real reactor, but it's also helpful for authorities who want to go out and measure. Uh, some company has a chunk of salt, you want to know how much fissile there is in this chunk, or they have a waste stream, you want to measure exactly what's in the waste stream. This is a very uh, useful technology for that. and. Uh, Auditors, for example, they could have it in a suitcase or in a backpack, so it's, it's, a, it's not a huge system. One of the other technologies that we are developing is this salt cleanup. Um, so, you know, if you want to have a really efficient reactor in, or, in order to be able to burn spent nuclear fuel, you need to get really good neutron economy. And also, if you want to make breeder reactors, you need really good uh, neutron economy. And in order to achieve that, you need to remove the fission products. Um, and of course that can be done in a wet chemistry power plant or a wet chemistry, chemistry plant add on to your reactor. Uh, but we found a way where you could uh, do this more simply, simply by uh, basically evaporating all the volatile fission products out of the salt while it's circulating. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, so, so you have uh, all the different uh, fission products are decaying all the time through the decay chain. This is what this simulation show. This is from a talk back in 2015 that I gave in India. Um, and once they are decaying, many of these fission products will come through a stage where there are um, a volatile element or where there are an element with a high uh, vapor pressure. So you can actually get lots of that out. And we have shown through simulation that you can get 50% of the fission product out of the salt simply with this method uh, where you don't need to do any wet chemistry. And uh, now we're doing all this stuff with uh, um, non-radioactive elements and in salt loops.
but we would like to make agreements with the companies or countries that has real salt loops where they're circulating uh, real salt with fission inside of it so we can test that this is actually working in the real world. In coping atomics, I also want to mention that we are a company who are really keen on openness and transparency and collaboration, both collaboration across borders, uh, but also co collaboration between companies, between academia and companies. And to that extent, we, we decided to make uh, some of our uh, software tools op uh, open source, make them available online, and we also have several data libraries that are available online. Um, now I want to go over and talk a little bit more about why we're doing this and why we think this is different than what I call old nuclear. Um, and the reason is that every year we add 80 million people to the global population. 80 million people, that's a lot of people. That's the entire population of Germany added every year. So essentially you have to build everything they have in Germany, all the roads, all the houses, all the cars, all the food, everything, every year. That's a huge challenge. And many people doesn't realize that, and especially politicians in Europe doesn't realize this. So this is the challenge that younger generations are faced with, and we should try to solve. And we think that energy is really important in solving that. And I brought along this graph to try to explain that. On the y-axis over here, we have the, an index number indicating prosperity in different countries, for the average prosperity for different countries' citizens. And on the x-axis, uh, it's the energy used per citizen in those countries. And as you can see, the x-axis is logarithmic. And uh, it's given in liters of oil equivalent per day. Um, and what you will see from this graph, just a big view, is that the vast majority of the global population is below the line of five liters per day. And I'm pretty sure that every one of them would like to move up in the upper right-hand corner. But the only thing or at least one of the important things that holding, holding this movement back is the amount of energy that is available to people. And as you can see from the graph there, just doubling the global energy production is not enough. It doesn't really bring a big difference. So we would need five times more energy in the world. And that, you know, if you start to look at it this way, oil and gas is just simply not going to provide. And wind and solar today provides, what, one, two percent of global energy, you know, to think that wind and solar can provide five times more energy than oil and gas is just laughable. Um, so we need something else, and maybe nuclear is the answer. Of course, that's why I'm here, because I believe that nuclear is a big part of the answer. Uh, but if we do nuclear like we've done it in the last three decades, it's not an answer in my opinion. Um, so this is what I'll continue to talk about. There's one funny thing here, even people up in the upper right-hand corner they also want to move further up in that direction. So it's not only people down here that want to move. Everybody want to move up. But energy is the limitation to that. If we look at the forecast for world energy uh, production in the next decades, we can see that the OECD countries are flatlining. Nothing is happening there. Don't waste, waste your time there. Um, but in Asia and Africa, where before the end of this graph, 80% of the global population is going to be in Asia and Africa. Uh, that's where all the growth is. And what you can see from these numbers is that the growth in the next decades is going to be much bigger than what we've ever seen before. So the growth is already starting to increase like crazy. And we have to see as an industry, nuclear industry, can we provide some of that? Of course, we are already providing some of that base load, or what we call the, the bottom of that. We're providing, what, around 3% of that. But we want to see, can we provide maybe 20% of that in the future? That's a question I want to answer. Um, and of course, I cannot answer it alone, but I would like to have the debate about that. Let's make a thought experiment just for the fun of it. Let's say that this growth over the next few decades of 4 terawatt, if we were to provide that from nuclear power, what would it take? Um, and as an example, I just used this uh, 50 megawatt Copenhagen Atomics Waste Burner. You can use any of the other reactors. This is just for an example. Um, but if you were to provide that amount of energy with these type of reactors, you would need a quarter of a million of these built. Um, and how, how do I come to that number? Uh, well, 
you, you would need, in the beginning, you would scale up and then build more and more every day. And by the end of that period, in 2040, you would have to build 60 of those reactors every day. And then if, you're, if you have ever worked in the old nuclear industry, you think this is bollocks. Building 60 reactors every day, it sounds crazy, right? But I want to remind you that we build 200,000 cars every day. And uh, this reactor, I don't know if any one of you recognize that reactor. And there's a few gentlemen who do. I had the good fortune to visit that reactor last summer. And uh, this reactor is, of course, the Hanford B reactor. It's one of the very first reactors ever built on this planet. It was built in 11 months from they broke the ground till the fission chain, chain reaction was running. And it's a two and a half gigawatt reactor. And it ran for 25 years without any accidents. <coughs> So this is engineering, this is physics. This is what is possible. If you, want, if you want it to take longer than that, it's also possible to you know, do it a lot slower and a lot more expensive. Of course it's possible. You just add a lot of more paperwork on top of that. And if it's not enough, add some more paperwork. But this is what's possible. And so again, back to the thought experiment. I want to talk a little bit about if I wanted, or if we wanted to provide four terawatt of energy before 2040, what are the roadblocks that we will run into? Well, again, I take the offset in the thorium uh, fuel cycle. Can we mine enough thorium to provide that amount of energy? Uh, yeah, I use roadblocks instead of stars or hearts. So one roadblock means that it's very easy. And of course, we can easily mine uh, 5,000 tons of thorium every year. It's not a problem at all. It's just a matter of somebody making a decision. The next problem can we can we produce all those pipes and valves and uh, vessels that we would need for all those reactors and in my opinion yes when we can produce 200,000 cars every day we can easily produce oh yeah and by the way the this uh, molten salt reactor that we're proposing the number of items that go into that the, the list of items is lower than for a high-end car so you need more items for a high-end car than you do for this. Of course, the quality assurance is different here. I recognize that. But once you have managed that in an industry and you're able to build it, then of course you can build that amount of pipes and valves every day. It's not a problem at all. But we will need to build out a supply chain that is very, very, very different from what we know in the nuclear industry today. And that will take time, and it's difficult. So that's why I put two roadblocks there. Then the next question, this is something where there's a lot of debate. Is there enough fissile fuel on this planet to start that many reactors? Because, of course, we need some fissile fuel, otherwise they're not going to run. Thorium alone, as you know, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and there's debate here. There's people, I'm sure even in this room, there's people who think there's plenty of nuclear fissile material to start all those reactors. And I'm also sure that there's some, some people here who think, no, it's not possible at all there's not enough fissile on this planet? And that's a big question. Is there enough fissile? Um, and I think as an industry or as scientists, this is something we need to discuss. And if we cannot even agree on that, it's of course clear that the politicians and the public, what are they to believe in? Um, in my opinion, uh, I think it's only possible to start or make this amount of energy if you have a breeder reactor. Without a breeder reactor, it's not going to happen. But that's my opinion. It's based on the design that I've seen. You might have another opinion. I think the discussion is really, really important. So tonight, if you have a beer with somebody, uh, bring on this up. You can see what other people think about it. Then the quality uh, assurance and the approval. Make sure that this is not dangerous, right? Can we do that? Is that difficult? Well, I think we all recognize that from all the speeches before me, this is, this is where the big elephant is in the room. This is super duper difficult. This is what we're up against. It's trying to get all these documents right. Um, but of course, it depends on the country. It's approval in different countries are not the same. So it all depends. But let me go back to this graph. I think you all know this, that nuclear power is already today proven to be one of the safest energy technologies to produce electricity for the population. Um, so my question is, if we were to make it 
the approval process 10 or 20 times lighter than what it is today, easier, less costly. How would that change that number down there at the bottom? Of course, more, you know, if we make it a lot lighter, 20 times lighter, there will be some accidents. And we will kill some people, but will we kill as many people as in the gas industry if we make it 10 times lighter? I find that highly unlikely because there's lots of engineers and they do good work. So even if we make it a much, much, much lighter approval process, <laughs> the likelihood that we will kill as many people as what we, where we get the energy from otherwise, it's, in my opinion, it's not likely. So in engineering, we, in, in nuclear engineering, the work is not to make better engineering. It's to make better documents or fewer documents or whatever. Um, so I think if, if we were to propose the following to a country, let's say there are some country where they have, I'm sure there's many countries on this planet where they don't have enough energy and where the people in that country are hurting and where they're burning a lot of coal to make just a little bit of energy. And as we all know, coal is killing people every day. There might even be countries where we kill more than a thousand people every day on purpose. And if that country, if such a country were to say, okay, come to our country and build molten salt reactors. We know that molten salt reactors are much more safe than old nuclear because you, you don't have the, the meltdown problem. Um, you don't have the, the waste problem is smaller. Um, and then you don't have the pressure. And the pressure is really helps you when you want to do the engineering. So if that country were to say, for example, come here, pay a hundred million dollars and we will give you a license. If, you're, if your design is not good enough, it's no cure, no pay. You can go away, we won't build your reactor because it's not good enough. If they were to put up such an offer to reactor vendors or some of these new startups that are building molten salt reactors, I'm sure they would have a molten salt reactor online within five years. So what we have to innovate is not in technology, it's not engineering, it's the business models that the countries are putting forward that needs to be engineered in my opinion. And if there was such a country that were willing to do this, then I think this thing would go down to be manageable. Then what about public acceptance? Uh, that's also really difficult. And I'm an engineer, so what do I know? Um, I give a lot of talks about molten salt reactors and how it works and all that. And um, whenever I meet people, uh, the, the worry they have is not so much about the everyday working of the reactor. What they're afraid of is really bad accidents or bad people. Like if this technology gets in the hands of bad people. Okay, but I'll get back to that. Then training and operating. Um, is that a problem to have enough people to, to make, create this new industry? Well, if I say that it's four terawatts, uh, it's similar size to the oil industry and we're eight billion people on this planet really soon. So a lot of young people, if they recognize that there's a new industry that's growing like crazy and it's going to be the size of the oil industry, they will come rushing in and they will do anything in, that they need to do to educate themselves. So I think training of people is not a problem. Uh, but yes, we, de we need a lot more young people in this industry. Um, yeah, back, back to this uh, bad people and bad accidents. What can we do about that? Um, I think all of us in here recognize that there's not such a switch that you can just flip and then these problems go away. If you want to get energy, energy from nuclear, these problems stay with you. But I think there's a lot we can do if we organize the way we do things so that we make this, the probability of these things happening a lot smaller. And uh, it's, it has a lot to do with how the fuel is uh, moved around. Because really the, the fuel, I think that's on the next slide actually. Oh yeah, um, okay, so one important thing in molten salt reactors is that uh, ever since we invented the fossil fuels, uh, I remind you that before fossil fuels we were less than one billion people on this planet and it was really hard work, really hard labor, human labor to survive. We had to work every day in the field. More than 80% of the global population had to work in in uh, uh, creating food in order to survive. 
then we invented the fossil fuels and everything changed. Now we have airplanes and the internet and television and whatnot. Um, so energy is really important. Um, but we have gotten used to this idea that fuel is something you supply regularly and the machine that you use to convert the fuel into energy is something more stationary. And it's really difficult, even for us in this industry, to get that model out of our head. But with molten salt reactors, it's different. Because the molten salt, you can clean it and you can use it for hundreds of years. And if you have a breeder reactor, it even increases over time. So the whole idea of fuel and machine changes. And of course, it also changes the business models that's going to uh, take effect in those different segments of the market or the industry. Um, so I think it's important to remind ourselves that this is very different from what we've been used to. Um, and I believe that in order to, to make this a safe new industry, we have to make sure that the fuel is handled in a safe way. Uh, and what we suggest is that the quality and the quantity and the location of the fuel is documented uh, very precise. And this knowledge should be public because if you have one country, they have nuclear, then all the neighbor countries have to trust that one country. And if we want to really have innovation, we should try to make these reactors available around the globe. And so what happens in one uh, country in the world affects the probability that the public would, will accept nuclear in other countries. So it, it's really important for all, all of us that fuel is handled in a safe way and it doesn't get in the hands of wrong people with the wrong intentions. So in order to certify the fuel, where it is, how much there is, this is, of course, I know it's already happening for uh, fuel pellets for, uh, as I call it, old nuclear. But we also have to get this in place for, uh, for molten salt fuels. Um, and what we are proposing is that uh, a new technology, the blockchain, could be a really effective way of keeping this type of information. And also, uh, it's a public type of information. So it cannot be damaged by any one country or anyone who wants to influence on it. The blockchain is something very stable, and this is the type of technology we need for this. And actually, Copenhagen Atomics is already working with a number of companies to try to see if we can set this type of technology up for handling the, f uh, the fuel supply for the new molten salt um, industry. And for us, it's really, really important that there's transparency, that everybody in the industry is know, knows what's going on, where things are moving, and especially also the, the waste product streams, where they're moving. And we think once this, is, this type of information is public and available, then a lot of the uh, public trust will come. Um, OK, I'm, I'm running out of time. But my last uh, things I want to mention is that there's a conference in Europe, in Brussels, in October. And uh, Koming Atomics will be there, and we will demonstrate one of our molten salt loops. So if you want to see molten salt flowing, uh, you can come and visit us there. And we will be happy to talk about some of the technologies we have developed. Thank you for having the opportunity to talk here.